Good evening, and welcome to Making Michigan, the Bentley Library's series of Zoom conversations about the history of the University of Michigan. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Gary Krenz, and I am pleased to be joined by our presenters tonight, my colleagues from the Bentley Library, Nancy Bartlett and Sarah McCluskey. I want to begin by saying on behalf of Nancy, Sarah, and myself that as the archives of the University of Michigan, the Bentley Library acknowledges that the historical origins and present locations of the university were made possible by cessions of lands by Anishinaabe and Wyandotte peoples under coercive treaties common in the colonization and expansion of the United States. We note in particular the grant of land made by the Anishinaabe under the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids for the, quote, College of Detroit, unquote, so that their children could be educated. These lands continue to be the homeland of indigenous people, and we seek to reaffirm and respect their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and to recognize their contributions to the University of Michigan. This evening's conversation will focus on two of the University of Michigan's uh, iconic buildings, the Michigan League and the Michigan Union. After Michigan Stadium, they are the, among the most visited locations on campus, with the Union located on State Street and the League on North University. Our presenters are two archivists who have dug deep into the origins of these two buildings. They have looked through many historical sources to explore how these buildings came into being and how they quickly became the backdrop for so many memories made at the University of Michigan. Tonight, as we talk, we will see a small sample of the rich documentation from the archives of the University at the Bentley Library. Our presenters are Nancy Bartlett, who is Associate Director of the Bentley. With two degrees from the University of Michigan, she has published a volume on the history of teaching architecture at the University and has curated the archives of several modern architects. The decorative, decorative details of the League and the Union inspired her to publish an essay on the colors of the University of Michigan over time, including the key moment in 1867 when students themselves chose maize and blue as the official school colors. Nancy curated the exhibit on the League and the Union, which some of you might have seen at the U of M Museum of Art a few years ago. Nancy, it's a pleasure to have you here. Sarah McCluskey is a project archivist at the Bentley, where she is part of the Reference and Academic Programs team. She works with visitors in the reading room and with the University of Michigan classes that are exploring and using the Bentley collections. She also set up the Bentley's digital exhibit site and adapted the Constructing Gender exhibit from the Museum of Art for digital display. She has used related material uh, in her class sessions, and Sarah, thank you for, for coming tonight. So let's get started, uh, and why don't we start with, the, with a big question, right? Simply, why are these buildings so important for the history of the University of Michigan? Thanks, Gary. Yeah. I'll, I'll start out, and I just want to say thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this fun topic. Uh, so I'll take a stab at the first answer, which is the Michigan Union and the Michigan League have been the go-to destinations for so many activities on the University of Michigan campus from the early 20th century on. And they will be shown in our very next slide. And here you can see them uh, with the reference, by the way, to the number that we use at the Bentley to archive and source them for further reference, if you would like. You will find all of the images that we are using tonight in the Bentley's image bank. And we're going to put a link up at the very end of the presentations to the link uh, to the, in the chat at the end of the presentation. So as these two buildings uh, have been the go-to destinations, they have had many, many marquee events that end up in the headlines of the student newspaper known as the Michigan Daily. And by the way, the Michigan Daily is also available online and searchable through the Bentley Library. And again, we're going to provide a link for all of you at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Dances were among the most popular and special events with this next photo showing the sophomore dance in 1920 and a couple of what were known as dance cards. And a dance card, if you don't know, was attached to a woman's wrist and was used to record with a tiny pencil the name of each partner for each dance. And uh, a lucky dancer would have a name for each dance. Um, and the university has many, many of these dance cards from the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. Next slide, please. 
We find in the archives of the university so much evidence of the importance of these two buildings, like the dance cards and the photos, and that evidence allows us to peek directly into the personal lives of so many, and also to begin to imagine the events that drew these large crowds. And I have just two, two examples out of many that I could have chosen. Two high profile examples of large events at the university are the concert performed at the Union by a young Ella Fitzgerald with the Chick Webb Orchestra in 1939 and a visit to the Union by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1962. And we, while we don't know exactly what songs Ella Fitzgerald sang, I'd love to know what she sang, we do see in the Michigan Daily what Dr. King said in part. And one of his quotes is that he said in the union, we must learn to live together as brothers or we will die together as fools. Next slide, please. So the union and the league have been very, very important for headline events and the types of visits that are a part of the everyday routine of generations of Michigan students, faculty, staff, alumni, and other visitors to campus, including these lovely ladies having lunch in the league around 1950. Student orientations, first dates, graduation, weddings, reunions, even memorial services, as the life cycle of so many members of the campus community are all remembered through photographs, through letters, postcards, scrapbook ephemera, film and video, publications, and most re recently, a lot of digital media in the archives. And the sheer volume of documentation from so many donors to the archives convinces us as archivists that these buildings very quickly became the social and the cultural and even the recreational anchor of Central Campus. Next slide, please. People took photographs they kept souvenirs and they wrote about their activities in the buildings like this very formal dance. These were the kinds of buildings that really inspired people to create memories of their times in them. Much more than the classrooms, for example, we have far fewer photographs from students in the classroom than we have of students and others in, in the league and the union. And there have been countless concerts, lectures, plays, dances, especially dances, and even protests in and around these buildings. They've literally housed a big part of the university's community, and we're lucky that a lot of that is documented, but there's still so much more that we wish we had. These buildings were important for the day that their doors officially opened, and for the union that was 1919, and for the league it was 10 years later in 1929. Those early years are what attracted us, especially as archivists, since they were less familiar than our own experiences in the building. So as Gary said, Emily Swenson and I, a few years ago, curated a physical exhibit at the Art Museum at the time of the university's bicentennial in 2017. And then Sarah subsequently created a beautiful online version of the building's history, which can be found in a link that we'll also provide. But if we go back even further in time than when these buildings actually opened their doors, we find that Michigan students were meeting in private homes, fraternities and sororities, gymnasiums, on the playing fields and parks, and even out in the countryside beyond campus. There weren't even dormitories at Michigan until 1915 when Martha Cook and Helen Newberry were built for female students. But it's safe to say that Michigan students always had an inclination to somehow organize and to find a certain kind of college spirit in doing so. We find out through the archives that already in 1846, students were gathering to sing informally. Uh, as Gary mentioned, the school colors, maize and blue, were decided by the students themselves way back in 1867. The first official football game was played in 1879 against Racine College in Chicago. The song, The Victors, was composed in 1898. But what started to happen at the beginning of the 20th century was two, were two things that were starting to put pressure on campus for even more student organization. First, there was a concern. There was a concern that the fraternity system and fraternity membership was becoming a divisive issue of either those who belonged to fraternities or those who did not. 
So there was a call in 1904, including from President Angel himself, for all male students to join a union. And at the same time, there were more and more female students on campus with very, very limited choices of where to gather. They had formed a club for themselves in 1890, known as the Women's League, just like the name of their eventual building. University of Michigan Women's League, as an organization in 1890, had 445 members. And it was thereby the biggest such female university club in the country. And by 1920, there were 2,761 female students on campus looking for a place to gather. So with a growing student population with many interests and a potential fracturing, there developed an eagerness and even an insistence on finding something that was convenient and comfortable and large and on campus. Like in the next slide, what was imagined by the union architects before it was built. There was also developing a sense that a good, I'm sorry, I, I mixed, messed up there, Sarah, that, that was out of order, that's my mistake. There was also developing a good, spacious meeting place on campus, that, the sense that this would help foster a good student spirit, and that would ultimately lead to good future leaders. So this campaign for clubhouses, both for male students and female students, was a part of a trend. And the first American Student Union was built in 1896 at the University of Pennsylvania. And from that year until around the time that the Michigan Union and League were built, most college unions were constructed either in the Midwest or in the Northwest, the East. And some observed that these unions were at the time, especially a sort of Midwestern centric notion. And just for a little bit of added context, the union at what was Michigan Agricultural College, or now Michigan State University, opened just a few years after Michigan's union in 1925. MSU's union was designed by the same architects who did U of M's union and league. And you'll hear about the architects a bit more later. But if these walls could talk, the union and the league would tell us that some of the uses of these buildings have not changed at all. They've, for example, always been a place to have a meal. They've also been a place to meet with student governance and student services occupying offices in both buildings from day one to today. They've also undergone significant changes in their uses and identities on campus. And so we're going to talk more about those original intentions and some of the changes that we see. Thank you, Nancy. That's a that's a great that's a great start. Um, so the uh, so the union and the league are this response to this sort of growing need for social space. And and you mentioned that you know this was in, in sort of a, a reaction to concerns about fraternities. Uh, you know the sort of the, the prior embodiment of at least some sort of social space. Is there anything more to say about that? I mean, was this concern among the students themselves, or was this kind of driven by? administrators or faculty, or, or is, there, is there a story there that we have information on that? We definitely have information on that. Um, one of the best places to start is the Michigan Daily, but one could also go straight to the top to President Angel's papers and find that there's a concern. And I, while well, I'm not an expert on this, I would say some of the concern has to do with a kind of boisterous rivalry that one can find. And it was not just between either fraternities or non-fraternities, but it was also between classes. And they would have these incredibly vicious battles at times that would uh, of course concern uh, people beyond campus in terms of possible destruction around Ann Arbor. But there's also at this time a kind of overall sense that um, especially in urban locations that buildings themselves could be uplifting, that there could be something about a union or a league that could inspire a certain kind of behavior. And if those buildings were available for all, then so-called all, um, then that would somehow be a communal uplifting. Sarah, did you wanna add anything? Um, I, I don't have much to add in this regard, but I think, um, you know, this, this time in the, 19 teens and 1920s when we see the construction of these buildings is not the first time that there had been debates on campus about what role or how big of a role fraternities and sororities should play. Um, I know one of my coworkers in our reference department has done some research into 
some of the earlier societies um, and, and kind of backlash against them at various points in the mid to late 1800s, um, kind of with the same concern that some of them were too secretive or divided off into um, little silos and that that's not what the campus should be. Thank you. So, so you know, Nancy mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of the kinds of events that were going on, and we saw some we saw some great images. Uh, Sarah, what are what are some of the most significant events that uh, have happened in these buildings? Um, so, as you saw a minute ago, because I clicked too many times, um, there have been, in addition to some of the things that Nancy talked about, the League and the Union have really been kind of at the center of a lot of things that were happening both on campus and uh, that could maybe be described as campus participation in broader political and, and social events in the country. Um, and so in that kind of second category, a uh, couple of pictures that we have here, um, the top left is uh, Kennedy's speech announcing uh, plans for the formation of the Peace Corps in 1960. He's out on the steps of the Union. Uh, perhaps a little bit less familiar for people. Down in the um, front right, we have a picture of the not yet finished Union building because construction was put on hold during uh, World War I. Uh, and so we have a picture of the unfinished Union building during World War I when it was, um, and, and soon after, when it was being used as a mess hall for the Student Army Training Corps, which is quite different from some of its later uses once construction was finished, uh, but still very much central to campus contributions to larger political events. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about some of the plays and concerts and the importance that uh, drama and entertainment had in these buildings, but um, that's that's kind of been a strain throughout uh, both of their histories, um, including the uh, Ella Fitzgerald concert that Nancy mentioned, but also performances by um, MC5, famed actors like Helen Hayes and Jimmy Stewart. Um, and it's also beyond these kind of larger events of political significance or um, entertainment events has been the site of students kind of reacting um, to events like that with criticism or um, with, with attempts to change the buildings, their uses or Kind of the campus environment in general to make it a better place. And so a couple examples of this would be um, protests in support of the Black Action Movement uh, and protests against the student group called Michigamwa. Uh, and so for that first one, the Black Action Movement strike, um, the, the kind of beginning of the Black Action Movement and the first strike that happened was in 1970. Uh, students who decided to strike the Black Student Union and then some other groups uh, from various professional, some of the professional schools on campus um, were concerned that Black students did not have a, a great environment when they came to campus. Uh, were concerned that recruitment and support for student Black students once they got here uh, were not what they should be. Um, and so they, in 1970, they went on strike and a lot of professors canceled classes in solidarity with the strike. Uh, large parts of campus were shut down. Their, one of their slogans was open it up to more black students or shut it down. Um, and eventually what they succeeded in doing was getting the university to agree to put more effort into recruiting black and Chicano students. Um, into also creating the Center for African and Afro-American Studies, which is now a department, uh, and into creating what would become the Trotter Multicultural Center, among other things. Um, and so you can see the league was kind of central to their celebration of that victory. Um, it was a victory dance in the league ballroom, celebrating some of the accomplishments that they had made. Uh, 
Now, when it comes to Mishigamawa, uh, the other kind of protest that's depicted here, um, Mishigamawa is a student organization that had a very, very long history of a relationship to the union. Um, it's a student organization that was fairly secretive, fairly exclusive. You were kind of invited to join if you were already um, a leader on campus. And in these early days, the, the members would have been male. Um, and they, for a long time, had kind of their own special meeting space in the union because when fundraising for the union was happening, Michigamwa was one of the student organizations that really worked hard to raise funds for the union and um, supported this these efforts to create a building where men in the union could meet. Um, and the reason they're called Michigamwa um, is because a lot of their uh, members' nicknames, traditions, um, the way that they operated, the way that their meeting room was decorated, uh, are all based on kind of appropriation or gross misinterpretations of Native American traditions, even though, you know, the majority of the members themselves were not Native American. And throughout uh, later decades on campus, we see um, other students starting to say, hey, this is not appropriate. We don't think this is a, a good tradition for you to have or a good name for you to hold. Uh, and starting, I think, in the 70s and 80s, um, there was a lot of backlash against their uh, kind of misappropriation of what they claimed were Native American rituals or they were not truly accurate in that way. Um, and so at various points, kind of in the 70s, 80s, they agreed to stop using those rituals, stop bestowing kind of fake Native American names on their members. Um, the protest here in 2000 uh, was, I think, spurred by some concern that they hadn't actually completely stopped that. And then later on, we start to see um, more pressure for them to change their name. So they're now what's known as the Order of Angel. Uh, but in, in both of these cases, the union and the league are, they're buildings on campus, but they're also really central to students thinking about how they make campus a place for themselves and that that really works for all students and different groups of students, I think. Thank you. So the, so the, Mich the Michigamwa uh, uh, episode, and some of us remember the occupation of the tower that uh, happened in the early 2000, uh, 2000 aughts, uh, sort of uh, puts the union forward as, as in that case, a site of exclusion. Of course, it was also a site of exclusion in another sense, right? At least into the 50s, because women were not allowed in the building uh, without an escort, without a male escort. Can you say, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so women were not uh, permitted into the league unless they were um, being escorted by a, a man. Um, and that's, I should say that's in contrast, or they were not allowed into the union. I just said they weren't allowed in the league. The league was their building. So. They had to be escorted into the union by a male student who was a member. Um, that's in contrast to the league because men were allowed in the league. They had their own kind of special separate co-ed lounge. And that's something that the Pond brothers really um, emphasized. Uh, and they, they really, as they were designing both buildings, they decided, you know, the presence of male students in some controlled kind of demarcated section of the league is really essential to the entertainment of female students. Female students are not, their presence is not essential to the um, social organization or entertainment of men in the same way. Um, and so you don't see women uh, being allowed to enter the league unaccompanied in most cases um, until 1956. Um, I should mention that even then, they weren't allowed into the uh, famed, very important to the architect's billiards room for about another 12 years in 1968. Um, there were, I think, some exceptions, say, for the, the swimming pool in the union, because the league didn't have one. There were very specific hours that were set aside for women to use the swimming pool separately. Um, but that was that was a very specific case where it was 
really seems like it was only because there was no other swimming pool for them to use. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, um, so Nancy, uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, how these buildings came about. And I think this is again, where we're going to see a little bit about how the different gender roles and visions of what it was to be a man and, or a woman. Uh, at the time that these buildings were built kind of come into play. So how, how you know, how, how did these come about? What's the, what are the differences between them? And uh, why are there two buildings, essentially, right? It, this is one of my favorite questions uh, to talk about when it comes to these two buildings. Um, so yes, student and alumni themselves were the driving force behind the push to build the union and the league with rendering such as this one that you can see right now for the union is a strong motivation. And here's where the story I think becomes really interesting. Male students and alumni organized for their union and female students and alumni organized for their league as another destination. So they had already from the beginning, two destinations, two genders. And that's, that's I think if anything, one of the most important sort of features of these buildings that they were intended for separate uses, men at the union, women at the league. In fact, as I had just mentioned earlier, the original name of the league as a building was the Women's League, just like the organization formed in 1890. And that got a little bit confusing in terms of the name of the building and the, the club, if you will. Um, and that, and it's, it's a sort of complicated story in itself, but the, the name of the building changed in the mid 1930s already to become Michigan League. And in the case for both buildings, there was this emphatic claim for why such a building was needed. So the men stated that they wanted, quote, a common meeting place with elbow room where all our members, and with the building completed, they stated democracy at Ann Arbor and in the very best sense of the abused word, as they put it, is forever assured. And there's no apparent irony at least an irony that we would see in that statement because it left out women entirely. And we also have seen anecdotally that there were others who were left out in that equation of a space for all. A newspaper in Chicago went even further by printing an over, over the top claim about a future union at Michigan by stating that the success of the Michigan union means that the value of the university to the nation will be enhanced manifold. I mean, these were really strong kinds of claims. And I find today looking at these, at this actual original language that there, there is an exclusive inclusion or an inclusive exclusion of some sort that is a really glaring contrast for us. It's one where some, but not all, were entitled to a new buildings or so they thought, even as the building ended up with a plaque stating for Michigan men everywhere, as you can see on this slide. So these were very aspirational claims, but they were claims with limitations as far as we see them today. There were also some more uh, pedestrian, but still very important arguments for the union, why there was a need for a union, with one being that it was impossible to find a good meal on State Street. So in the next slide, we find that there was a complaint, a kind of wordy complaint that no one who is familiar with present day student life here can doubt that the union restaurant would receive large and steady patronage. One has only to stroll along State Street any evening and note the enormous consumption of hot dogs, red hots and soda drinks and other death dealing concoctions dear to the student palate to realize that a grill room in an attractive club would be an effective agency in conserving the digestion of future generations of Michigan students. And there are a lot of other examples in the archives of this sort of hyperbole. But it's interesting to note the difference then in how female students and alumni lobbied for a building of their own as I mentioned before, by 1920, there were 2,761 female students on campus. Before they had a league, they had one side of the library's reading room and they, and they chose to congregate there. They also had their own gymnasium built in 1894, but the gym was pretty much it in terms of a large space for them to gather. What these women did not do, and I find this really interesting, is they did not insist upon equal access to the union. And, and I think that that's a really important point. They wanted their own space too. And they recognized that women needed a place not only to socialize, but also to organize 
with, quote, practice and organized group life. And this is a really interesting development in the early 20th century, this notion of women organizing. Um, and it was felt that women, even University of Michigan women, could not become competent leaders without training and practice, and that they should have that kind of training and practice as students at the university. And so while there is that notion of leadership that easily resonates with us today, there are qualifications around it, around that notion of leadership that make us realize that there is in fact a century of distance between us and these women of a century ago. Could we have the next slide, please? Here's an example, another a quote that highlights the difference in how women of a century ago saw the ultimate purpose of the league. They stated that such a building gives a chance for work in big groups in this day of organization. This is as essential for a woman as for a man, whether she marries immediately or whether she doesn't. A woman who cannot make contacts with her community is not the ideal wife or mother of today. So there you, there you have this really interesting kind of framing of, of the notion of a building for empowerment in a certain kind of modern woman. But while the incentives for the two buildings were stated quite differently, the way to realize these two buildings required the same kind of effort. And I personally think this is interesting too. It's that the students and the alumni themselves had to raise the funds. These were not university funded buildings. And I just, I, I ponder over, there, over that and I'm, I'm so impressed with the ability of students and alumni to raise all of the funds for these buildings, which would be next to impossible, I think today, uh, to imagine the same kind of uh, coming together nationally to raise funds for these buildings. So there was fundraising and it was across the country and it was super well organized. Um, and we have the archives around the kind of language they use, the kind of mailing lists they use, the sort of organizational structure for the fundraising. And in each case, the challenge was to raise $1 million. It was a huge effort. And it was really quite modern in itself. Um, here's the good thing. For, for the female students and alumni, there were already 9,000 female alumni at the time of the building campaign for the league. So, so there, were, there were many, many people who could be approached and asked. Um, and the slogan for the league campaign was, this is the house that Jill would build. So the short version of the answer is that a lot of effort went into fundraising and it succeeded. And again, these were really impressive uh, organizational tactics that were used. And what both buildings have in common is that they were intended to be a place to meet, to organize, to eat, to study, to socialize, and even to stay overnight in, in either of these buildings because they originally both had hotel rooms. The union had a barber shop and the league had a so-called beauty parlor. There were reading rooms in each, with the unions being a place where a student could come to read newspapers from around the country, um, really like a gentleman's club, if you will. Next slide, please. The many differences between the two buildings in terms of function include that the union had several recreational facilities, including a bowling alley and a swimming pool and a billiards room. And the billiards room at the beginning was so important to the architects that there's even a rendering of the billiards table in the archives. And, and apparently billiards was so fashionable um, that in, in the early days of the union, there was the need to uh, equip a second room for billiards. Um, and sadly, the billiards room is no longer. But and in contrast to such fitness oriented activities as bowling and swimming and even billiards, the union was also a place to smoke together. And I think that that's a really interesting contrast too, that there were these so-called smokers, which were considered very fashionable and huge deal and faculty and distinguished visitors would come and take part in these so-called smokers. And you find many, many advertisements for them in the Michigan Daily. The league, on the other hand, did not have recreational facilities other than a big ballroom, big, beautiful ballroom. But that was likely because there was a women's gymnasium right across the street on North University. Next slide. Instead, what the league had and has is the Lydia Mendelssohn Theater, 
um, a dedicated space for performances, unlike the union, which did not have a theater per se. And the league also had a space for reflection as part of its original design. And I just have to mention one of the delightful little anecdotes I found in the archives is there was one woman who recalled from her time in the 1930s that she would quietly go into the library within the league to learn about sex as her kind of quiet education in the league. So that was another kind of particular uh, use of the league. Thank you. So, so you mentioned the fundraising and uh, the online exhibit has a couple of uh, has a couple of fundraising documents on it, uh, one for each of these uh, campaigns. And, and it, it seems to me that there, there are some interesting differences between what appear to be the, the fundraising strategies employed by the men and by the women. I mean, if, 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 as I read the men's document, uh, a lot of it has to do with competition. Uh, you know, with other institutions, competition among the men themselves about raising money. Uh, whereas the women's document is kind of, um, you know, there are quotes in it, for instance, uh, from, uh, from women who, because they are in some sort of difficult circumstance, would love to be able to give money, but can't. And it's this kind of appeal to their sisters, as it were, to, uh, to raise the funds because this other unfortunate person is not able to... Uh, is not able to contribute. Can you, can you I just yeah. love to hear reflections about that or thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, that there was an actual uh, financial uh, uh, difference, if you will, in the kind of reaching out to alumni versus alumni, um, that, that this, this was seen as a kind of collective uplifting of all women from those who could, in fact, from those who did have the resources to support um, their sisters, um, so-called. Um, and, and you're right, the, the, the male campaign was a little more of a bravado kind of campaign, sort of what Michigan men put their minds to do, they can do. Uh, it was almost, almost a bit more like a, a sports kind of activity in terms of the sort of language that was used. Um, Gary, if I could yeah. add also one of my, not so much in the documents present in the exhibit, but in some of the other reading I was doing as I was trying to figure out how to adapt the exhibit for online use. Um, one of my favorite things that I found is the fact that actually um, both fundraising campaigns refer to that gymnasium for the women that Nancy mentioned, um, because it was, it was constructed, um, there was Waterman Gymnasium, which the male students use, and then Barbara was added on to it for the women um, a bit later, but in the, I think in the, in the late 1800s. So both of them were already there. Um, and one of the arguments that the men made as they were um, raising money for the union was, well, the women already have a building, you know, not a, not a building for their um, broad organization of all the female students to meet, but they have a building, they have a gym. I mean, they have something that's just theirs. Why don't we have our own union? Um, and then of course the women uh, roughly a decade later raising money for the league are saying, well, we really need a league building because we have to use the gym for everything. Like our social events are in the gym. It's all we have. Uh, so I, I found it really kind of entertaining that both groups referred to the women's gym as an example of why they needed another building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. And so, so the league was was uh, located across across the street from uh, from Barber from the Barber gym, the women's gym. Is there anything else to say about the locations of these buildings? Is there anything significant in that? Um, yeah. So I think in in some ways it makes sense that the league and the union as very social buildings would be more segregated than um, some other parts of campus, say the academic buildings. Um, I'm, of course, I'm not referring here to dormitories, which are a different case. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, they only arrived in about 1915. The first ones were really only for female students. Um, and students who didn't live in a dormitory would would probably have lived in a uh, like a boarding house or a rooming house off campus. Uh, the boarding houses available to female students in particular were vetted by the league. They, you'll see mentions of league houses um, to make sure that they were appropriate uh, living space for female students. Um, but aside from those, those dormitories, um, 
you know, I, I think it does make sense that the social buildings a little bit more than the academic ones would be segregated. Uh, but it's really interesting to look at the way campus was laid out at this point. Uh, and you'll see here a map. This is the only slide uh, that's not an image from our collection. It's from the Clark Library um, on Central Campus. And just for reference, north is to the left, if that helps you orient yourself a little bit. Um, but it's not just individual buildings. There's actually kind of an orientation and an arrangement of buildings on campus that's divided up by gender in a similar way. Um, so you have the league and then right across the street, you have that barber gymnasium. Um, the union you know, is a little bit farther away from the men's gym, but it is kind of heading to the Southwest uh, in the direction of the stadium. You can see going off the um, bottom right of the page there, kind of towards what, what now would be the South Campus or Athletic Campus. Um, the women's, uh, the league building is kind of headed off in the, the direction of the Northeast, so diagonally across campus. Um, and, you know, I think um, one, as you're looking at this, one thing you might notice is that, well, there are some women's dorms next to the union building, right? There's Martha Cook. Uh, but one of the things I, I found um, while I was working with a class that was looking at the construction of Martha Cook and the, um, the law quad, uh, which were really funded by the same donor, Martha Cook's son, that's why it's named after her. Uh, and one of the things that he remarked on was that this this kind of stood out as the women's dorm being over in this maybe this more male area of campus so he's saying things when he's corresponding with the students who lived there in the early days um you know he's saying oh i bet the the female students are really excited to have the law building with all the men studying in the law library right next door uh matchmaking opportunity um and so that was actually something that that kind of maybe seemed like it wasn't arranged quite the way that everything else was and kind of stood out a little bit, which I thought was really interesting. Thank you. I want to just interrupt for a moment and say to the audience, uh, you know, we'll get to audience questions uh, pretty soon. And please, um, please make sure you enter your questions into the Q&A, not into the chat. Uh, that way we'll be sure to, uh, to see them. Uh, so, so the buildings, you know, they, they were designed by the same architects, but I mean, they look similar. And, and Nancy, what can you say about the designs? Of the, of sure. The yeah. yeah. So um, the buildings were designed by these two uh, lovely brothers, Irving and Alan Pond, and they are themselves Ann Arbor natives. Uh, their father was Ella Hugh Pond, a, a well-known journalist in Ann Arbor, and they were Michigan graduates. Um, I just want to mention an earlier claim in life for Irving was that he scored the very first touchdown for the University of Michigan at that game uh, against Racine. And he wrote about it later in life, um, not as an architect, but as a sportsman, claiming that he ended up running through the beachers, bleachers and then jumping over his opponents to make that very first score for the University of Michigan. So he, uh, he had a bit of a humor to him. Uh, but they were excellent choices for architects. They had been practicing in Chicago. They had built some in Ann Arbor, but they had been practicing Chicago since 1886. And they had experience in, in designing and building a kind of comparable urban uh, building uh, type, which was Hull, the Hull House settlement, settlement um, as well as other settlement houses in Chicago. Um, and so if we could have the next slide. Um, it's quite obvious uh, in normal times when one has the opportunity to, to wander through these buildings um, that they have many design elements in common. If you take a careful look, if you kind of slow down to look at some of the details, you will see that there are common, the common use of building materials, including leaded glass and wood paneling and brick and limestone. There are decorative elements such as the figures on the exterior of both buildings. And there's a similar distribution of spaces. And this, I have to say, is one of my absolute favorite photographs. It's such a quiet, serene view of the Michigan Union with the um, one of the front staircases off to the right. Each building has a very elegant lobby as its entrance, ballrooms upstairs, meeting rooms distributed throughout, and what I would call a grand presence along the street. And I think it's fair to say that these were intended to be statement buildings. 
Do you have the next slide, please? Uh, the Pond brothers as architects had this really interesting kind of mystical interest in, in ornamental design that appears in both buildings in variations of a square or rectangular cubes with or without their color palette of pale blues and yellows and rose and purple. And you find it in stone, wood, glass, ceramic, um, metal. Uh, it's, it's very interesting that you find this motif throughout these buildings. Um, a mystery for me is why it doesn't seem to have, there is not color on the stonework and the ceramic work in the league while there is in, in the union. They describe this ornamental detail in, in a way that I find um, curious. They stated, the architects stated that it would illustrate the individual gaining poise, strength, and perfect character. I'm not sure how many people look at these and think about poise and character, but that word character I think is very important. And, and there we have it again uh, from, from the architects themselves. They saw their buildings as codifying a way of becoming, a way of, of being. Um, if we could have the next slide. For the league, the Pond brothers wanted to achieve what they called a subtle something. There are very explicit signals of this, more, much more obvious to us today than the colored cubes are, as, as beautiful as those cubes are. There are images of, for example, the ideal scholarly, social, and athletic women, as well as murals of famous women in the Hussey room upstairs in the league. And this is Mumtaz Mahal, um, at, and uh, she is uh, referenced in the building and, and she was apparently the inspiration for the Taj Mahal. So very, very inspirational figure here. If we could have the next slide, please. The union um, entrance features an athlete oriented towards the athletic fields to the south and a scholar oriented, toward it, oriented towards the main area of campus. Very clear signals of the intentional positioning of this building. And the league entrance features a figure titled either friendship or character. And here you can see a, a, a drawing of, of the figure. And so these four figures, two on the union and two on the league, were the symbols outside to inform all who entered of the rather aspirational significance of these buildings. And I find it very interesting um, that there, there are these kind of comparables between the two buildings, but I would say that the scale of the union is larger, obviously, uh, to house many more male students than the, the much more intimate league. Um, and in fact, the director of the league at the time that it was, um, for which funds were being raised, claimed that it was to have all of the atmosphere of home. And, and again, that's a very, gendered, if you will, kind of reference there. It's a domestic sort of reference. And the architects themselves kind of play with this. They, they, they said that in a man's building, the very minimum of accommodation for women may be quite properly provided. While in a woman's building, the maximum of accommodations must be provided for men. So men will gather in clubs and enjoy themselves without the presence of women. So there was this kind of reinforcing of the code of these buildings through the ar architects and beyond. The women were intended to occupy a home at the league while the men had a club as their destination. And you can even imagine that in the kind of scale of the staircases, the entry points of these buildings. The league staircases are, are of a smaller dimension than those of the, of the main uh, staircases of the union. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, uh, you know, so again, the same architects, but uh, uh, looking just at the slide that's up now, uh, and these two different sorts of uh, exterior sculptures. Uh, I mean, those the for the union, those are those are not, of course, uh, statues of actual individuals, but they are nonetheless sort of individualized sculptures. Whereas for the league, it's just this. I mean, the the two sculptures are identical, and they're just this kind of ideal ideal woman, very abstract. I mean, any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, one thing that, um, that intrigues me um, about the female figures is that it was a female sculptor who was commissioned by the Pound Brothers to, to depict the female. Uh, and I'd love to know more about her story as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Also, yeah. I guess in the you know the, you you showed some of the murals uh, in the league. I mean these inspirational yeah. murals, but there was nothing comparable in the in the union. Is that right? Not that, not that I'm aware yeah. of. Yeah. There there may be an expert in our audience that can prove me wrong, but I'm not aware of. Yeah. I mean there there have hung portraits in in the union, such as the portraits of the presidents of the university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know materials uh, that you've used uh, on these topics in, in in your in the classes that have come to the Bentley? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, as Gary said um, in the beginning of the presentation, I spend about half my time working in reference to so individual researchers, but the other half um, working to plan classes. So figuring out. Uh, with professors, what students might want to look at, what material at the Bentley would be helpful to them as they're learning how to use primary sources or trying to refine or clarify or complicate um, concepts in their classes. And so one of the things that I found most interesting and most helpful uh, as I was working through the material for this exhibit, figuring out how to put it online, uh, was that it really changed and, and kind of deepened my understanding of the unions and the league's presence on campus, but also um, what kind of importance um, they had to a sense of community among students. Um, so I, you know, previously I, I was a student uh, at the School of Information here, so I wasn't completely unfamiliar with the union or the league. I'd, I'd seen, I think, some of the collection material when I was a student assistant here at the Bentley. Um, but I didn't, they didn't hold the same kind of social or um, kind of social significance or familiarity that they might uh, for someone who was an undergraduate on campus, which is really in some ways a different experience um, and, and you know, found them central to their student organization meetings or uh, used the billiards room, which I actually did before, uh, just a few years before it uh, disappeared, I think. Um, but, you know, they didn't have quite the same significance for me. And so working on the exhibit um, really helped me think about um, how people were included or excluded as, as Nancy has discussed a little bit. Um, and that could be sort of what you see going on here um, in these images. Uh, the, the men, um, you know, making use of this billiards room. As Nancy said, it was wildly popular uh, decades after the union's uh, construction, as you can see here, still in use. Um, but also, uh, if you a look at the um, this really wonderfully scathing article by a Michigan Daily student reporter named Donna Hansen. Uh, it's mark so it's marking the admission of women into the union, um, and there's a just this really great sarcastic quote towards the bottom. Women have battled and obtained the right attained the vote, the right to attend universities, the right to speak even when not spoken to, and now, at long last, the privilege to walk up the sacred steps of the Michigan Union. Um, she's pretty clearly, uh, you know, skewering the, the previous prohibition. Um, so I found this particularly entertaining to read. Uh, but beyond, you know, kind of chuckling at that and, and dwelling on the fact that until 1956, it there was a building that so excluded women on campus, even though it wasn't their campus. Um, it, I think it's helped me understand how gender divisions operated on campus in ways that made it a lot easier to answer students' questions as they were learning about related topics. Um, and so one of those topics is um, we had a transgender history class that at some of our material related to student drama productions, uh, which, as I mentioned before, uh, moving beyond the sort of professional um, singers or actors, people who came to campus for specific performances, uh, student drama societies were wildly popular. Um, the plays and musicals they put on were 
attended by large numbers of their their classmates. Um, and so one of the things that this transgender history class looks at is some of the performances uh, in particular from the 1920s. But one of the interesting things, because both the union and the league had their own um, dramatic societies, their own groups, is that um, each, each group uh, had plays and musicals where all of the roles were played by people from their own building their own society. So for the league, that would mean that all of the roles in the production were played by students who were female or at least assigned female by society. Um, and the same, all of the roles played by played in union performances were, were played by male students or assigned male students. Um, and in particular, the example that this class looks at was the is the story of this uh, student called Lionel Ames. I he, he went by Mike, which was his nickname. Uh, but Ames was in several union performances, including the one pictured here uh, on the right. Uh, so it's called Cotton Stockings. Uh, and that's um, in the, the large headdress and the um, slinky dress right here. Uh, this is Ames in costume, in character as the lead role. Um, and you can see they they were um, they, they kind of made a feature of this in their advertisements. So they they say here, our handsomest girls are men in some of the publicity. And so as students were looking at this, as they were thinking about, um, you know, the role that these productions might have played on campus, how students might have viewed gender. Um, I was my, my background knowledge of the union and the league was very helpful um, because they started asking, you know, where would they have performed these productions? And that's actually quite different. Uh, the women who are performing in league productions pretty much stayed on campus. Um, and, you know, in particular, they had their own theater, the Mendelssohn Theater. Uh, so that was, you know, their kind of female domain in which to perform. Uh, the men, including Ames and the people involved in Cotton Stockings, toured across the country, um, and not not just on college campuses, but in theaters that also hosted, you know, more quote professional productions. Um, and Ames actually later on after graduation became what then would have been called like a professional female impersonator, um, and so as I'm as I'm talking with the classes, you know, part of the way that I'm thinking about this and part of what I'm able to share with them is the way in which the league and the union, again, were both inclusive and exclusive. They provided opportunities, but also kind of separated people. Um, so for the women, that means they don't get to tour, but they do get their own production that they can plan and put on and kind of control themselves. Um, for the men, um, and in particular for uh, for Ames in this case, you know, it, perhaps if there had been a co-educational drama society, um, he wouldn't have been allowed that that kind of um, opportunity to play female roles and and starring female roles and um, to do something that would kind of later turn into part of his career. Um, so that I think has been really interesting to me, and I'm I'm glad that I had the knowledge I did to be able to contextualize some of that for the, the class. Thank you, that, that, that's great. And you also uh, sort of touched a little bit on maybe what's the, what's the last question we'll, we'll uh, raise before we uh, get to the audience questions. Uh, and that's just for both of you. How has, how has working on these exhibits changed the way you think about these buildings? Uh, and, and are there things that you, uh, what, I mean, are there questions that aren't yet answered that you would love to figure out how to answer? So um, maybe I'll go first that I, one of the things I'm very, very curious to know about um, is the most recent renovation of the union apparently involves students in uh, thinking about what the newest sort of iteration of the union should look like. I would love to know more about what their thoughts were in sort of reinventing the union. And, and I think it's really poetic that, you know, a hundred years later, there were still students kind of in, in the foreground of thinking about the union. So that's a question that I hope someday will be answered 
answerable in the archives, if you will. And I can't wait to get back into the union um, once COVID is, is over, hopefully. Um, but the other things that I'm kind of curious about is I happen to know that there's a cornerstone of the league that has content within it. And this is always an, a, a great mystery for the archives and beyond. What is the content exactly? And apparently the content um, includes things that were used for fundraising, like playing cards that were sold or handkerchiefs that were sold. Um, and I would just love to know more about what that content is. Um, but I would also say much more generally beyond kind of the anecdotal curiosities of the contents of the cornerstone. I, I would like to know more about more, if you will. I would like to know more uh, about contemporary times. Um, we have the advantages of scrapbooks having been so in vogue in the early 20th century. And there was this kind of inclination to document the student experience in a certain way. But I'd love to know more about how these buildings were kind of thought about during the counterculture of the 60s and the 70s. How were they used and how were they used in different ways. Um, and I would just say, and you know, I often say this, that we're always looking for more material, even from many decades ago. So if there are people listening tonight who might happen to have something from, from their youth or from their parents or grandparents, we would love to know about that. Um, I, I'm also very, very curious about the exclusive element of these buildings um, and, uh, and what it meant to not experience them as a part of either the union or the league. Um, and I'm curious about what it meant to work in these buildings. What did it mean to work in the kitchen of either the union or the league? So those kinds of working experiences at the university are way less documented than the student experience. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I would love to know about the power dynamics of the women who were involved in building the league. How did the Vandenberg Room get the name Vandenberg? Um, we know some about it um, and it has to do with the fundraising. Um, but I would love to know more about the kind of women and their dynamics in working together in this fundraising. And then finally, my uh, last example that I'll use of a longer list is I am curious about Nellie Walker as the female sculptor who, who produced uh, um, character and friendship for the league. So that's kind of a short list of, of questions that, that linger for me. Sarah, would you like to? Uh, yeah. So I, I think you know, some of the things that I was, I'm still curious about and, and will hopefully be able to research further uh, are similar to Nancy. Um, so I, I do wonder about the people who worked at the league um, or worked in the league and the union, uh, be they, you know, full-time employees where they were not also students, but also maybe some of the, I've seen adver advertisements before um, saying, you know, if you are a student who needs employment or is otherwise kind of going to be struggling on campus, uh, suggesting that they go to the union or the league. So I'd also be really curious to know, you know, did those jobs differ from people who just worked there and were not also students or were they more like what we would think of today as student jobs, kind of a separate category? Um, and then also, you know, if you worked there, did you then also turn around and become part of the one of the men in this, you know, gentleman's club when you're no longer uh, working your shift, uh, serving some of those people? Um, so that would, I, that's very interesting to me. Also, I think the experiences of students of color earlier on in the, league, the Union and League's histories, um, you know, looking at the photographs that we have, I don't, uh, to the extent that you can tell from a photograph, um, I don't see a whole lot of their presence. Um, I know a couple of my coworkers on our university history team might have are kind of starting to find partial answers for some of this uh, as they research um, African American students who attended the university prior to 1970. Um, but I, I would be interested, um, kind of, in how students of color felt connected or didn't uh, to the the union and the league, um, especially in those early decades. And then finally, I think. Just over the past couple semesters, one thing I'm curious about, less in terms of archival research and more in terms of working with classes and with students, is you know looking at this exhibit, looking at the research, it is very place-based, but it's also about providing community 
opportunity for students, um, be that exclusive or inclusive, depending on the circumstances. Um, and so I, I'm trying to figure out, are there lessons that we can draw from these buildings that are helpful in establishing or maintaining a sense of community for all of the students who aren't on campus um, this semester or last or, or perhaps next semester um, and, and figuring out what lessons we can take from these very specific buildings that are really about place but more than place and about providing an opportunity for students as well. What does that look like when we're not all on campus? Thank you both, that's great. Um, so we, we have a few um, we have a few uh, questions from the audience, uh, and we may get more in. Uh, so first is, uh, how unique was uh, Michigan uh, in having these two separate uh, facilities for men and women? Or was this true on other campuses, as far as you know, or was this fairly rare? Well, if we look within the state of Michigan, I happen to know that the union at uh, Michigan State University was intended for both genders, although um, there was a space within uh, Michigan State's uh, union that was uh, explicitly for women only. Um, I don't know all the details. I would love to know more about that. Michigan State University also has an archive. Um, so that's, that's one example. I think the overall size of the University of Michigan uh, was part of the reason that it was compelling to have two buildings. Um, but I, I honestly don't know uh, more about the overall trend. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So, uh, so the students raised the money, but what about the land? Uh, was the land purchased or was it donated by the university or what was the source of the land on which these buildings uh, sit? Um, sorry, I, Gary, I couldn't quite hear you. Is that directed to me? Because um, I, I believe the university did set aside the the plots of land on which the buildings were constructed. Um, it was just the actual buildings that the students had to raise the money for. Uh, Nancy might be able to yeah, correct me if that's yeah. inaccurate. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Yeah, and and they are and, and it's what's also interesting is this is the moment in time where the buildings of of the university are expanding out beyond the original diag area. <laughs> So it's right around the same time as Hill Auditorium crosses the street onto the other side of North University. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it, it's a very interesting kind of ecosystem around campus that there were actual neighborhoods right next to campus um, on the north side and on the west side where these buildings are being built. And you, you, don't, you don't experience that in the same way today, but it, it's almost like the neighborhoods are kind of hovering um, around campus in a much tighter kind of fabric than, mm -hmm. than they are today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to think about them sort of being more embedded in the surrounding yes. town. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I think that this might be our last question. Uh, uh, do you think that the location uh, of the League and Barber uh, Gymnasium in particular had uh, anything to do with the construction of women's dorms on the hill and out in that direction? The short version of an answer is yes. <laughs> uh, Moshe Jordan, I know it was probably one of those um, just a few years later. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what what level of influence that had, but definitely once the league was there, that's one of the next stories that they constructed. Uh, the Women's Athletic Association facilities also were um, just, just to the north. Mm -hmm. And the nurses' dormitory and the uh, dances in the field along um, Washtenaw. So it's a very sort of female side of campus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, yeah, that's all the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, is there anything that either of you would like to say before we before we wrap up? I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to to share um, a conversation about these really treasured buildings and. Um, it was a it was it was a pleasure. Well, thank you both. I mean, I think this has been really enlightening. I've enjoyed it a lot. I mean, I, like you, I can't wait now to get back into the buildings because I know that uh, 
uh, I'm going to look at them look at them differently. Right. So thank you both for 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 this. Uh, I also want to thank Lara Zeeland for uh, doing uh, the behind the scenes uh, work and and support. Uh, great job as always, Lara. Thank you. Uh, and I want to say thank you to the audience, of course. Uh, this session will be available on the web in uh, a week or so uh, on, our, on our History of U of M website uh, and the uh, lecture, uh, uh, the Making Michigan website, uh, web page. Uh, and I hope you'll join us in March when we will be talking with Mark Clegg from Music Theater and Dance uh, about the harmonies, uh, the social harmonies and dissonances in the Michigan Songbook. Uh, until then, you know, be safe and stay well and good night.